Okay, part three of Einstein's essay. I have now reached the point where I may indicate briefly what to me constitutes the essence of the crisis of our time. It concerns the relationship of the individual to society. The individual has become more conscious than ever of, depend, of his dependence upon society. But he does not experience this dependence as a positive asset, as an organic tie, as a protective force, but rather as a threat to his natural rights, or even as his economic existence. Moreover, his position in society is such that the egotistical drives of his makeup are constantly being accentuated, while his social drives, which are by nature weaker, progressively deteriorate. All human beings, whatever their disposition in society, are suffering from this process of deterioration whatever their position in society. Unknowingly, unknowingly, prisoners of their own egotism, they feel insecure, lonely, and deprived of the naive, simple, and unsophisticated enjoyment of life. Man can find meaning in life, short and perilous as it is, only through devoting himself to society. The economic anarchy of capitalist society as it exists today is, in my opinion, the real source of evil. We see before us a huge community of producers, the members of which are unceasingly striving to deprive each other of the fruits of their collective labor, not by force, but on the whole in faithful compliance with legally established rules. In this respect, it is important to realize that the means of production, that is to say, the entire productive capacity that is needed for producing consumer goods as well as additional capital goods, may legally be and for the most part are the private property of individuals. For the sake of simplicity, in this discussion that follows, I shall call workers, all those who do not share in the ownership of the means of production, although this does not quite correspond to the customary use of the term. The owner of the means of production is in a position to purchase labor power of the worker. By using the means of production, the worker produces new goods, which become the property of the capitalist. The essential point about this process is the relation between what the worker produces and what he is paid both measured in terms of real value. Insofar as the labor contract is free, what the worker receives is determined not by the real value of goods he produces, but by his minimum needs and by the capitalist's requirement for labor power in relation to the number of workers competing for the job. It is important to understand that even in theory, the payment of the worker is not determined by the value of his product. Private capital tends to become concentrated in few hands, partly because of competition amongst the capitalists and partly because technological development and the increasing division of labor encourage the formation of large units of production at the expense of smaller ones. 
The result of these developments is an oligarchy of private capital, the enormous power of which cannot be effectively checked even by a democratically organized political society. This is true since the members of legislative bodies are selected by political parties, largely financed or otherwise influenced by private capitalists who, for all practical purposes, separate the electorate from the legislature. The consequence is that the representatives of the people do not, in fact, sufficiently protect the interests of the underprivileged sections of the population. Moreover, under existing conditions, private capitalists inevitably control, directly or indirectly, the main sources of information, i.e., the press, radio, and education. It is thus extremely difficult and indeed in most cases quite impossible for the individual citizen to come to objective conclusions and to make intelligent use of his political rights. The situation prevailing in an economy based on private ownership of capital is thus characterized by two main principles. First, means of production, capital, are privately owned, and the owners dispose of them as they see fit. Second, the labor contract is free. Of course, there is no such thing as a pure capitalist society in this sense. In particular, it should be noted that the workers, through long and bitter political struggles, have succeeded in securing a somewhat improved uh, form of the free labor contract for certain categories of workers. But taken as a whole, the present-day economy does not differ that much from pure capitalism. Now, this is, this is Albert Einstein talking. I will continue with uh, the um, part with part four of Einstein's essay.